Theme 2 Writing and City Life City life began in Mesopotamia, the land between the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers, that is now part of the Republic of Iraq. Mesopotamian civilization is known for its prosperity, city life, its voluminous and rich literature, and its mathematics and astronomy. Mesopotamia's writing system and literature spread to the eastern Mediterranean, northern Syria, and Turkey after 2000 BCE, so that the kingdoms of that entire region were writing to one another and to the pharaoh of Egypt in the language and script of Mesopotamia. Here we shall explore the connection between city life and writing and then look at some outcomes of a sustained tradition of writing. In the beginning of recorded history, the land mainly the urbanized south was called Sumer and Akkad. After 2000 BCE, when Babylon became an important city, the term Babylonia was used for the southern region. From about 1100 BCE, when the Assyrians established Assyria, the first known language of the land was Sumerian. It was gradually replaced by Akkadian around 2400 BCE when Akkadian speakers arrived. This language flourished till about Alexander's time, 336 to 323 BCE, with some regional changes occurring. From 1400 BCE, Aramaic also trickled in. This language similar to Hebrew became widely spoken after 1000 BCE. It is still spoken in parts of Iraq. Archaeology in Mesopotamia became, began in the 1840s. At one of the two sites, including Uruk and Mari, which we discussed below, excavations continued for decades. No Indian site has ever seen such long-term projects. Not only can we study hundreds of Mesopotamian buildings, statues, ornaments, graves, tools, and seals as sources, there are thousands of written documents. Mesopotamia was important to Europeans because of references to it in the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible. For instance, the book of Genesis of the Old Testament refers to Shemar, meaning Sumer, as a land of brick-built cities. Travelers and scholars of Europe looked on Mesopotamia as a kind of ancestral land, and when archaeological work began in the area, there was an attempt to prove the literal truth of the Old Testament. From the mid-19th century, there was no stopping the enthusiasm for exploring the ancient past of Mesopotamia. In 1873, a British newspaper funded an expedition of the British Museum to search for a tablet narrating the story of the flood mentioned in the Bible. By the 1960s, it was understood that the stories of the Old Testament were not literally true, but may have been ways of expressing memories about important changes in the history. Gradually, archaeological techniques became far more sophisticated and refined. What is more, attention was directed to different questions, including reconstructing the lives of ordinary people, Establishing the literal truth of biblical narratives receded into the background. Much of what we discuss subsequently in the chapter is based on these later studies. Mesopotamia and its geography Iraq is a land of diverse environments. In the northeast lie green undulating plains gradually rising to tree covered mountain ranges with clear streams and wildflowers with enough rainfall to grow crops. Here, Agriculture began between 7000 and 6000 BCE. In the north, there is a stretch of upland called a steppe, where animal herding offers people a better livelihood than agriculture. After the winter rains, sheep and goats feed on the grasses and low shrubs that grow here. To the east, tributaries of the Tigris provide routes of communication into the mountains of Iraq, of Iran. The south is a desert, and this is where the first cities and writing emerged. This desert could support cities because the rivers Euphrates and Tigris, which rise in the northern mountains, carry loads of silt. When they flood or when their water is let out onto the fields, fertile silt is deposited. 
after the Euphrates had entered the desert, its water flows out into the small channels. These channels flood their banks and in the past functioned as irrigational ca canals. Water could be let into the fields of wheat, barley, peas or lentils when necessary. Of all ancient systems, that of the Roman Empire included, it was agriculture or southern Mesopotamia that was the most productive, even though the region did not have sufficient rainfall to grow crops. Not only agriculture, Mesopotamian sheep and goats that graze on the steppe, the northeastern plains and the mountain slopes produce meat, milk, wool in abundance. Further, fish was available in rivers and date palms gave fruit in summer. Let us not, however, make the mistake of thinking that cities grew simply because of rural prosperity. We shall discuss other factors by and by, but first let us clear about city life. The Significance of Urbanism Cities and towns are not just places with large populations. It is when an economy develops in spheres other than food production that it becomes an advantage for people to cluster in towns. Urban economies comprise, besides food production, trade, manufacturing, manufactures and services. City people thus cease to be self-sufficient and depend on the products or services of other people. There is continuous interaction among them. For instance, the cover of a stone seal requires bronze tools that he himself cannot make and coloured stones for the seals that he does not know where to get. His specialization is fine carving, not trading. The bronze tool maker does not himself go out to get the metals, copper and tin. Besides, he needs regular supplies of charcoal for fuel. The division of labor is a mark of urban life. Further, there must be a social organization in place. Fuel, metal, various stones, wood, etc. come from many different places for city manufacturers. Thus, Organized street and storage is needed. There are deliveries of grains and other food items from the village to the city and food supplies need to be stored and distributed. Besides, many different activities have to be coordinated. There must be not only stones but also bronze stones, tools and pots available for seal cutters. Obviously, in such a system some people give commands that others obey and urban economies often require the keeping of written records. The Warka Head This woman's head was sculpted in white marble at Uruk before 3000 BCE. The eyes and eyebrows would probably would have taken lapis lazuli, blue and shell, white and bitumen, black and lace, respectively. There is a groove along the top of the head, perhaps for an ornament. This is a world-famous piece of sculpture admired for the delicate modelling of the women's mouth, chin and cheeks, and it was modelled in a hard stone and would have been imported from a distance. Beginning with the procurement of stone, list all the specialists who would be involved in the production of such a piece of sculpture. Movement of Goods into Cities However rich the food resources of Mesopotamia, its mineral resources were few. Most parts of the south lacked stones for tools, seals and jewels. The wood of the Iraqi date palm and poplar was not good enough for carts, cartwheels or boats, and there was no metal for tools, vessels or ornaments. So we can surmise that the ancient Mesopotamians could have traded their abundant textiles and agricultural produce for wood, copper, tin, silver, gold, shell, and various stones from Turkey and Iran, or across the Gulf. These latter regions had mineral resources, but much less scope for agriculture. Regular exchanges, possibly only when there was a social organization to equip foreign expeditions and direct the exchanges were initiated by the people of southern Mesopotamia. Besides craft, trade and services, Efficient transport is also efficient, important for urban de development. If it takes too much time or too much animal feed to carry grain or charcoal into cities on pack animals or bullock carts, the city economy will not be viable. 
the cheapest mode of transportation is everywhere over water. River boats or barges loaded with sacks of grain are propelled by the current of the river and or wind. But when animals transport goods, they need to be fed. The canals and natural can channels of ancient Mesopotamia were in fact routes of good transport between large and small settlements. And in the account of the city of Mari later in the chapter, the importance of Euphrates as a world route will become clear. The development of writing. All societies have languages in which certain spoken words convey certain meanings. This is a verbal communication. Writing too is verbal communication, but in a different way. When we talk about writing or a script, we mean that spoken words are represented in visible signs. The first Mesopotamian tablets, written about 3200 BCE, contain picture-like signs and numbers. These were about 5,000 lists of oxen, fish, bread, loaves, lists of goods that were brought into or distributed from the temples of Uruk, a city in the south. Clearly, writing began when society needed to keep records of transactions because in city life, transactions occurred at different times and involved many people and a variety of goods. Mesopotamians wrote on tablets and clay. A scribe put wet clay and pat it into a size he could hold comfortably in one hand. He would carefully spoon in its surfaces. With the sharp end of a reed cut obliquely, he would press wedge-shaped signs onto the smoothened surface while it was still moist. Once dried in the sun, the clay would harden and tablets would be almost as indestructible as pottery. When a written record of, say, the delivery of pieces of metal had ceased to be relevant, the tablet was thrown away. Once the surface dried, signs could not be pressed onto a tablet. So each transaction, however minor, required a separate written tablet. This is why tablets, however minor, this is why tablets occur by the hundreds of Mesopotamian sites. And it is because of the wealth of sources that we know so much about Mesopotamia than we do about contemporary India. By 2600 BCE or so, the letters became cuneiform and the language was Sumerian. Writing was now used not only for keeping records, but also making dictionaries, giving legal validity to land transfers, narrating the deeds of kings, and announcing the changes a king has made in the customary laws of the land. Sumerian, the earliest known language of Mesopotamia, was gradually replaced after 2400 BCE by Akkadian language. Cuneiform writing in the Akkadian language continued in use until the first century CE, that is for more than 2000 years. The system of writing. The sound that a cuneiform sign represented was not a single consonant or vowel, but syllables. Thus, the signs of Mesopotamian scribe had to learn ran into hundreds and he had to be able to handle a wet tablet and get it written before it dried. So writing was a skilled craft, but more important, it was enormous intellectual achievement. Conveying in visual formed the system of sounds of particular language. Literacy Very few Mesopotamians could write and read. Not only were there hundreds of signs to learn, many of these were complex. If a king could read, he made sure that this was recorded in one of his own boastful inscriptions. For the most part, however, writing reflected the mode of speaking. A letter from an official would have to be read out to the king, so it would begin, To my lord, A, speak. Thus says your servant, B, I have carried out the work assigned to me. A long mythical poem, but creation ends thus. Let these verses be held in remembrance and let the elder teach them. Let the wise want and the scholar discuss them. Let the father repeat them to his sons. Let the ears of even the herdsman be opened to them. The uses of writing. The connection between city life, trade and writing is brought out in a long Sumerian epic poem about Enmerkar, one of the earliest rulers of Uruk. In Mesopotamian tradition, Uruk was the 
city par excellence, often known simply as the city. And Merkur is associated with the organization of the first trade of Sumer. In the early days, the epic says trade was not known, and Merkur wanted lapis lazuli and precious metals for the beautification of a city temple and sent his messenger out to get them from the chief of a very distant land called Arata. The messenger heeded the word of the king. By night he went just by the stars, by day he would go by the heaven's sun divined. He had to go up into the mountain ranges and had to come down out of the mountain ranges. The people of Sosa, Susa, a city below the mountain, saluted him like a tiny mice. Five mountain ranges, six mountain ranges, seven mountain ranges he crossed. The messengers, the messenger could not get the chief of Aratha to part with lapis lazuli or silver, and he could make the long journey back and forth, again and again carrying threats and promises from the kings of Uruk. Ultimately, the messenger grew weary of mouth. He got all the messages mixed up. Then Emerker formed a clear tablet in his hand, and he wrote the words down. In those days, there had been no writing down of words on clay. Given the written tablet, the ruler of Aratha examined the clay. The spoken words were nails. His face was frowning. He kept looking at the tablet. This should not be taken as literal truth, but it can be inferred that in Mesopotamian understanding, it was kingship that organized trade and writing. This poem also tells us that, besides being a means of storing information and sending messages afar, writing was seen as a sign of superiority of Mesopotamian urban culture. Urbanization in Southern Mesopotamia Temples and Kings From 5000 BCE, settlements had begun to develop in Southern Mesopotamia. The earliest cities emerged from some of these settlements. These were of various kinds, those that gradually developed around temples, those that developed as centers of trade and imperial cities. It is cities of the first two kinds that will be discussed here. Early settlers began to build and rebuild temples at selected spots in their villages. The earliest known temple of various gods, of the moon god of Ur, or of Inanna, and the goddess of love and war. Constructed in brick, temples became larger over time with several rooms around open courtyards. Some of the early ones were possibly not unlike the ordinary house, for the temple was the house of a god. But temples always had their outer walls going in and out at regular intervals, which no ordinary building ever had. Which no ordinary building ever had. The god was the focus of worship. To him or her people brought grain, curd and fish. The floors of some early temples had thick layers of fish bones. The god was also the theoretical owner of agricultural fields, the fisheries and the herds of the local community. In time, the processing of produce was also done in the temple. Organizer of production at a level above the household, employer of merchants and keeper of written records of distribution and allotments of grains, plough animals, breed, bread, beer, fish, etc. The temple gradually developed its activities and became the main urban institution. But there was also another factor on the scene. In spite of natural fertility, agriculture was subject to hazards. The natural outlet channels of the Euphrates would have too much water one year and, the flood, the, and flood the crops and sometimes that would change the course altogether. As the archaeological record shows, villages were periodically located in Mesopotamian history. There were man-made problems as well. Those who lived in the upstream stretches of a channel could divert so much water into their fields that villages downstream were left without water, or they could neglect to clean out the silt from their stretch of the channel, blocking the flow of water further down. So the early Mesopotamian countryside saw repeated conflict over land and water. When there was continuous warfare in a region, those chiefs who had been successful in war could oblige their followers by distributing the loot and could take prisoners from the defeated groups to employ as their guards or servants so they could increase their influence and clout. 
Such war leaders, however, would be here today and gone tomorrow. Until a time came when such leadership came to increase the well-being of the community with the creation of new institutions or practices. In time, victorious chiefs began to offer precious booty to the gods and thus beautify the community's temples. They would send men out to fetch fine stones and metal for the benefit of the god and community and organize the distribution of temple wealth well in an efficient way by accounting for things that came in and went out. As the poem about Enmerkar shows, this gave this king high status and authority to command the community. We can imagine a mutually reinforcing cycle of development in which leaders encourage the settlement of villagers close to themselves to be able to rapidly get an army together. Besides, people would be safe living in close proximity to one another. At Uruk, one of the earliest temple towns, we find depictions of armed heroes and their victims, and careful archaeological surveys have shown that around 3000 BCE, when Uruk grew to the enormous extent of 250 hectares, twice as large as Mohenjo-daro would be in later centuries, dozens of small villages were deserted. There had been a major population shift. Significantly, Uruk also came to have a defensive wall at a very early date. The site was continuously occupied from about 4200 BCE to about 400 CE. And by about 200, 2800 BCE, it had expanded to 400 hectares. War captives and local people were put to work for temple or directly for the ruler. This rather than agricultural tax, was compulsory. Those who were put to work were paid rations. Hundreds of ration lists have been found which give against people's names the quantities of grain, cloth or oil allotted to them. It has been estimated that one of the temples took 1,500 men working 10 hours a day, 5 years to build, with rulers commanding people to fetch stones or metal ores to come and make bricks or lay the bricks for a temple, or else to go to a distant country to fetch suitable materials, there were also technical advances at Uruk around 3000 BCE. Bronze tools came into use for various crafts. Architects learned to construct brick columns, there being no suitable wood to bear the weight of the roof of large halls. Hundreds of people were put to work at making and baking clay, cones that could be pushed into temple walls, painted in different colours, creating a colourful mosaic. In sculpture, there were superb achievements, not in easily available clay, but in imported stones. And then there was a technological landmark that we can say is appropriate to an urban economy, the potter's wheel. In the long run, the wheel enables a potter's workshop to mass-produce dozens of similar pots at the same time. The seal, an urban artifact. In India, early stone seals were stamped. In Mesopotamia, until the end of the first millennium BCE, cylindrical stone seals pierced down the center, were fitted with a stick and rolled over wet clay so that a continuous picture was created. They were carved by very skilled craftsmen and sometimes carry writing. The name of the owner, his god, his official position, etc. A seal could be rolled on clay, covering the string knot of a cloth package of the mouth of a pot, keeping the content safe. When rolled on a letter written on a clay tablet, it beca became a mark of authenticity. So the seal was the mark of a city dweller's role in public life. Life in the city What we have seen is that a ruling elite has emerged. A small section of society had a major share of the wealth. Nothing makes this fact as clear as the enormous riches, jewellery, gold vessels, wooden musical instruments inlaid with white shell and lapis lazuli, ceremonial daggers of gold, etc. Buried with some kings and queens at Urbut. But what of the ordinary people? We know that the legal text that in the Mesopotamian society, the nuclear family was the norm. Although married 
a married son and his family often resided with his parents. The father was the head of the family. We know a little about the procedures for marriage. A declaration was made about the willingness to marry, the bride's parents giving the consent to the marriage. Then a gift was given by the groom's people to the bride's people. When the wedding took place, gifts were exchanged by both parties who ate together and made offerings in temple. When her mother-in-law came to fetch her, the bride was given her share of inheritance by her father. The father's house, herds, fields, etc. were inherited by the sons. Let us look at Ur, one of the early cities that have been excavated. Ur was a town whose ordinary houses were systematically excavated in the 1930s. Narrow winding streets indicate that wheeled carts could not have reached many of the houses. Sacks of grain and firewood would have arrived on donkey back. Narrow winding streets and the irregular shapes of houses also indicate an absence of town planning. There were no street drains of the kind we find in contemporary Mohenjo-daro. Drains and clay pipes were instead found in the inner courtyards of the Ur houses and it is thought that the house roofs sloped inwards and rainwater was channeled via the drain pipes into sums in the inner courtyards. This would have been a way of preventing the unpaved streets from becoming excessively slushy after a downpour. Yet people seem to have swept all the household refuse into their streets to be trodden underfoot. This made street levels rise. And over time, the thresholds of houses had also been raised so that no mud would flow inside after the rains. Light came into the rooms not from the windows but from doorways opening into the courtyards. This would have given families their privacy. There were superstitions about houses recorded in omen tablets at Ur. A raised threshold brought, brought wealth. A front door that did not open towards another house was lucky. But if the main wooden door of a house opened outwards instead of inwards, the wife would be a torment to her husband. There was a town cemetery at Ur in which graves of royalty and commoners have been found, but a few individuals were found buried under the floors of ordinary houses. A trading town in pastoral zoned. After 2000 BCE, the royal capital of Mari flourished. You will have noticed that Mari stand not on the southern plain with its highly productive agriculture, but much further upstream on the Euphrates. Map tree with its color coding shows that agriculture and animal rearing were carried out close to each other in this region. Some communities in the kingdom of Mari had both farmers and pastoralists, but most of its territory was used for pasturing sheep and goats. Herders need to exchange young animals cheese, leather, and meat in return for grain, metal tools, etc., and the manure of a pen flock is also of great use to a farmer. Yet at the same time, there may be conflict. A shepherd may take his flock to water across a sown field to the ruin of the crop. Herdsmen, being mobile, can raid agricultural villages and seize their stored goods. For their part, settled groups may deny pastoralists access to river and canal and canal water along a certain part, set of parts. Through Mesopotamian history, nomadic communities of the western desert filtered into the prosperous agricultural heartland. Shepherds would bring their flocks into the sown area in the summer. Such groups would come in as herders, harvest laborers or hired soldiers, occasionally became prosperous and settled down. A few gained the power to establish their own rule. These included Akkadians, Amorites, Assyrians, and Arameans. The kings of Mari were Amorites whose dress differed from that of the original inhabitants and who respected not only the gods of Mesopotamia but also raised a temple at Mari for Dagon, god of the steppe. Mesopotamian society and culture were thus open to different people and cultures and the vitality of the civilization was perhaps due to the intermixture. The kings of Mari, however, had to be vigilant. Herders of various tribes were allowed to move into the kingdom, but they were watched. 
The camps of herders were mentioned frequently in letters between kings and officials. In one letter, an officer writes to the kings that he had been seeing frequent fire signals at night, sent by one camp to another, and he suspected that a raid on an attack is being planned. Located on the Euphrates in a prime position for trade, in wood, copper, tin, oil, wine, and various other goods that were carried in boats, along the Euphrates between the south and the mineral-rich uplands of Turkey, Syria and Lebanon. Mari is a good example of an urban centre prospering on trade. Boats carrying grinding stones, wood and wine and oil jars would stop at Mari on their way to the southern cities. Officers of this town would go on board, inspect the cargo and levy a charge of about one-tenth of the value of the goods before allowing the boats to continue downstream. Bali came in special grain boats. Most important, tablets refer to the copper from Alasia, the island of Cyprus. Known for its copper and tin, was also an item of trade. As bronze was the main industrial material for tools and weapons, this trade was of great importance. Thus, Although the kingdom of Mari was not militarily strong, it was exceptionally prosperous. Excavating Mesopotamian Towns Today, Mesopotamian excavators have much higher standards of accuracy and care in recording than in the old days, so that a few dig huge areas the way ore was excavated. Moreover, few archaeologists have the funds to employ large teams of excavators, Thus, the mode of obtaining data has changed. Take the small town at Abu Shalabik, about 10 hectares in area, in 2500 BCE, with a population less than 10,000. The outlines of walls were at first traced by scraping surfaces. This involves scraping off the top few millimeters of the mound with the sharp and white end of a shovel or other tools. While the soil underneath was slightly moist, the archaeologists could make out different colours, textures and lines of brick walls or pits of other features. A few houses that were discovered were excavated. The archaeologists also sieved through tons of earth the recovered plant and animal remains, and in the process identified many species of plants and animals and found large quantities of charred fish bones that had been swept out onto the streets. Plant seeds and fibre remained after dung cakes had been burned as fuel and thus kitchens were identified. Living rooms were those with fewer traces because they found the teeth of very young pigs on the street. Archaeologists concluded that pigs must have roamed freely here as in any other Mesopotamian town. In fact, one house burial contained some pig bones, the dead body must have been given some pork for his nourishment in the afterlife. The archaeologists also made microscopic studies of room floors to decide which rooms in the house were roofed and which were open to the sky. Cities in Mesopotamian culture Mesopotamians valued city life in which people of many communities and cultures live side by side. After cities were destroyed in a war, they recalled them in poetry. The most poignant re reminder to us of the pride Mesopotamians took in their cities comes at the end of Gilgamesh epic, which was written on twelve tablets. Gilgamesh is said to have ruled the city of Uruk some time after Enmerkur. A great hero who subdued people far and wide, he got a shock when his heroic friend died. He then set out to find the secret of immortality, crossing the waters that surround the world. After a heroic attempt, Gilgamesh fa failed and returned to Uruk. There he consoled himself by walking along the city wall back and forth. He admired the foundations made of fired bricks that he put into place. It is on the city wall of Uruk that the long tale of heroism and endeavour frizzles out. Gilgamesh does not say that even though he will die, his sons will outlive him, as a tribal hero would have done. He takes consolation in the city that his people had built. 
the legacy of writing while moving narratives can be transmitted orally orally science requires written text that generations of scholars can read and build upon perhaps the greatest legacy of mesopotamia to the world is its scholarly tradition of time reckoning and mathematics dating around 1800 BCE are tablets with the multiplication and division table square square root tables and tables of compound interest the square root of 2 was given as 1 plus 24 by 60 plus 51 by 60 square plus 10 by 60 cube if you work this out you will find that the answer is 1.4142196 only slightly different from the correct answer students had to solve problems such as the following a field of area such and such is covered one finger deep in water find the volume of water the division of the year into 12 months according to the revolution of the moon around the earth the division of the month into 4 weeks a day into 24 hours and the hour into 60 minutes all that we take granted in for granted in our daily lives has come to us from the mesopotamians these time divisions were adopted by the successors of alexander and there transmitted to the roman world and then to the world of islam and then to medieval pe- europe when ever solar and lunar eclipses were observed the occurrences were noted according to year month and day so too there were records about the observed positions of stars and constellations in the night sky none of these momentous mesopotamian achievements would have been possible without writing and the urban institution of schools where students read and copied earlier written tablets and where some boys were trained to become not record keepers for administration but intellectuals who could build on the work of their predecessors we would be mistaken if we think that the preoccupation with the urban wall of mesopotamia is a modern phenomenon let us look finally at two early attempts to locate and preserve the texts and traditions of the past an early li- library in the iron age the assyrians of the north created an empire at its height between 720 and 610 bce that stretched as far west as egypt the state economy was now a predatory one extracting labor and tribute in the form of food animals metals and craft items from a vast subject population the great assyrian kings who had been immigrants acknowledged the southern region babylonia as the center of high culture and the last of them assurbanipal collected a library at his capital nineveh in the north he made great efforts to gather tablets on history epics omen literature astrology hymns and poems he sent his scribes south to find all tablets because scribes in the south were trained to read and write in schools where they all had to copy tablets by the dozens there were towns in babylonia where huge collections of tablets were created and acquired fame and all the sumerian ceased to be spoken after about 1800 bce it continued to be taught in schools through vocabulary texts signless bilingual tablets etc so even in 650 bce cuneiform tablets written as far back as 2000 bce was intelligible and assurbanipal's men knew where to look for early tablets or their copies copies were made of important texts such as epic of gilgamesh and the copier stating his name and the writing date some tablets ended with a reference to assurbanipal i assurbanipal king of the universe king of assyria on whom the gods bestowed vast intelligence who could acquire the recondite details of scholarly erudition i wrote down on tablets the wisdom of gods and i checked and collated the tablets i placed them for the future in the library of the temple of my god nabu at nineveh for my life and the well-being of my soul and to sustain the foundations of my royal throne more important there was cataloging a basket of tablets would have been would have a clear label that read 
N number of tablets about exorcism written by X. A Surbani Paul's library had a total of some 1,000 texts amounting to about 30,000 tablets grouped according to subject. And an early archaeologist, a man of southern marshes, Nabo Pulasar, released Babylonia from Assyrian domination in 625 BCE. His successors increased their territory and organized building projects at Babylon. From that time, even after the Achaemenids of Iran conquered Babylon in 539 BCE and until 331 BCE, when Alexander conquered Babylon, Babylon was the premier city of the world, more than 850 hectares, with a triple wall, great palaces and temples. A ziggurat or stepped tower and a processional way to the ritual center, its trading houses and widespread dealings and its mathematicians and astronomers made some new discoveries. Nabonidus was the last ruler of the independent Babylon. He writes that the god of Ur came to him in a dream and ordered him to appoint a priestess to take charge of the cult in that ancient town in the deep south. He writes because for a very long time the office of high priestess had been forgotten, her characteristic features now nowhere indicated, I bethought myself day after day. Then he says he found the steel of a very early king, whom we today date to about 1150 BCE, and saw that, saw on that steel the carved images of the priestess. He observed the clothing and the jewellery that was depicted. This is how he was able to dress his daughter for her consecration as priestess. On another occasion, Nabonidus meant brought to him a broken statue inscribed with the name of Sargon, king of Akkad. We know today that the latter ruled around 2370 BCE. Nabonidus and indeed many intellectuals had heard of this great king of remote times. Nabonidus felt he had to repair the statue. Because of my reverence for the gods and respect of kingship, he writes, I summoned skilled craftsmen and replaced the head.